Amen. All right, let's take our Bibles and look in Ezra chapter 4. My text for this message is from verse 1 down to verse 16. And I want to speak about dealing with opposition. Dealing with opposition. From this point forward in this story, this narrative here with Ezra, and then right on into the book of Nehemiah, and even Esther, the one common denominator that we're going to find in these three books is conflict and opposition against that people that we just read about in Jeremiah that God would bring back and establish again in the land that represented his remnant, his elect. And that wherever you find in God's word, God doing his work for his honor and glory, there is going to be opposition. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where God said that he would put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. So that's what we're reading here and understanding and uh, we see taking place. Where there is wheat, there are going to be tares. Where there are sheep, there are going to be goats. That's just how God's purpose was. And so let's read this here in Ezra chapter 4. It says, now when the adversaries of Judah, notice how they're called, adversaries, enemies. Paul spoke of those in his day that were enemies of the cross, of whom he spoke even weeping because of their <coughs> enmity. That's what that word is, adversary, enmity. And when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord, God of Israel. Then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers. So again, in this story, Zerubbabel is the one God used, raised up to rebuild that temple. He's a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they came to him and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, let us build with you. For we seek your God as they, as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Ezar Hadon, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, you have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. So here there were adversaries, but they were trying to appear as if they were one with Zerubbabel and these that the Lord had preserved and wanting to contribute, wanting to join in, form an alliance. So you can see where this is headed. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. Their pretense in saying that we are of one mind with you and your God is our God, it didn't take long once Zerubbabel told them no, they began then to persecute those that were in the land and troubled them in building. Well, if you won't let us contribute, then we're going to make it tough for you to build. So they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Remember when we studied in Daniel, all these were the different, the, the Medes and the Persians during that entire time, they were the ones that came in and had conquered Babylon, and Cyrus had given the decree for these to return, but during that whole time, these here persecuted those that had returned. 
So it really mentions three different changes of kings here. Cyrus, then Darius, and then in the reign of Ahasuerus. Well, when we get over to Esther, that's where that name now is known because this was the one before whom Esther went to plead on behalf of the Jews because of persecution. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Artaxerxes, wrote Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabil, and the rest of their companions under Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the writing of the letter was written in the Syrian tongue and interpreted in the Syrian tongue. The Syrian tongue would be the Aramaic. Returned, or Rehom, the chancellor, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, in, in this sort. Then wrote Rehom, the chancellor, and Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, the Denites, the Aphrasites, and the Tarpalites, the Aphrasites, the Archivites, the Babylonians, the Susanshites, the, the Hevites, and the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Ashnapper brought over and said in the cities of Samaria and the rest that are on this side of the river and at such a time, this is the copy of the letter that they sent unto him, even unto Artaxerxes the king, thy servants, the men on this side the river, and at such, such a time, be it known unto the king that the Jews which came up from thee to us are come unto Jerusalem, building the rebellious and the bad city, and have set up the walls thereof and joined the foundations. So you got a little transition here because at the beginning they talked about the building of the temple. But after the temple, now was the laying of the foundations again of the city and the building of the walls. Be it known now unto the king that if this city be builded, and the wall set up again, then will they not pay toll, tribute, and custom, and so thou shalt endamage the revenue of the kings. So it's interesting, they went from saying, we want to work with you to build the temple, and when Zerubbabel saw through their intentions and their motives, they began to persecute the people and now it turns into a political matter. They went before these Persian kings saying that if you let these folk continue to build, they'll no longer give you tribute or custom, and that will endamage the revenue of the kings. This is the way false religion works. It's like we see in Revelation, the beast and the false prophet. The beast being the government and the false prophet being false religion. That's always been that way. Now, because we have made maintenance from the king's palace, and it was not meet for us to see the king's dishonor, therefore have we sent and certified the king. It's interesting there, we have maintenance. This was somewhat like a socialistic government. They, they live off of whatever the kings was sending them. And... Uh, they're saying that because we see all of this being disrupted, that we thought best to notify the king. That search may be made in the book of the records of thy fathers, so shalt thou find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city and hurtful unto kings and provinces and that they have moved sedition within the same of old time for which cause was this city destroyed. We certify the king that if this city be built again and the walls 
thereof set up by this means, thou shalt have no portion on this side of the river, on this side of the Euphrates, what they're talking about there. So this is the opposition and the tactics that these use as unregenerate adversaries to God and to his work and to his people are the same that we see today, that if the Lord's people cannot be brought into compromise, then those that oppose will seek to bring the people into subjection through political force and power. That's what they did with our Lord Jesus Christ, according to God's purpose, of course. But when the religious leaders could not get our Lord Jesus Christ to bow to their traditions and uh, to their customs, because our Lord would have nothing to do with them, then what they do? They turn to Caesar. They turned to Pilate and Herod and ultimately through that means had him crucified and slain without realizing all the while that God was accomplishing his will and his purpose even through them. So coming back here to verses 1 and 2, these people that are mentioned here were not happy that Judah and Benjamin had come back to, to Judea, and thus they were their adversaries. This must be some of those people that Nebuchadnezzar, when he came into the land and took out the different ones into captivity, these would have been the lowest and the poorest of the land that were left behind like we saw in Jeremiah, probably some of the bad pigs that were worthless even to a king like Nebuchadnezzar. And so all these years, here they were living there in the land thinking that now the land was theirs without any regard to what God had purposed should be done in that land. And of these, we have some hint too, would have been some of the Samaritans that while these others had been taken into captivity into Assyria, that there was a remnant of these Samaritans that remained in the land. And the, the reason I say that is because in verse 2, when they're talking about how their way of worship was the same, we have the same God anyway. They were saying, let us build with you, for we seek your God, as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him, notice, since the days of Ezar Haddon, king of Asher. They're referring back to over nearly 200 years previous when Asher had come down, Assyria had come down, and taken many into captivity, but the way the Assyrians worked is they they came back into the land and intermarried whereas Nebuchadnezzar his way of doing it was taking everything worth anything out of the land and so this lays the groundwork really for some of the difference that there was between the Samaritans and the Jews all the way up into Christ time because the Samaritans had nothing to do with the Jews and Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans because the Jews considered themselves to be the purists and these Samaritans, so, so these here that, that remained in the land, they would have been Jews that had intermarried with the Assyrians that came down in the land and out of that came a whole new form of worship. The Jews would have called these, quote, half-breeds because they were part Jew, but also part Assyrian and a mixed race, but also a mixed faith, a mixed religion. And that's why 
this is important in understanding over in Luke chapter 10. This is where all this began. In Luke chapter 10, when Christ identifies himself as the good Samaritan, the one that was despised and rejected of men. In Luke 10, in verse 25 to 37, you remember this story here of the man that was taken on the road to Jericho, starting in verse 30, Jesus answering when they, they, they sought to justify themselves, these Pharisees. And well, when we go up there in verse 25, behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Some people look at that and say, Well, what was Christ doing? quoting the law. Well, these were lawyers. These are ones that saw themselves as being impeccable in, in view of the law. And so the Lord was putting it right back. If you can, and the same is true today, were it possible that somebody could obey perfectly the law, he says, just do and live. The problem is no one can. But they thought they could. And so the Lord hits them right at their point of rebellion with regard to what it is to love your neighbor. What is the love? First of all, love the Lord thy God with all thy strength and might, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's when they sought to justify themselves and they asked this question, verse 29, who is my neighbor? And so the Lord answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Why does the Lord use a priest? Because these were the Jews. And saw this man and has no thought even to care for him. That's all religion can do. It can't help people that are wounded and left for dead. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed on the other side. So our Lord is already, by telling this story, pointing a finger at these very priests and Levites that boasted themselves in keeping the law and yet had no regard for a man such as this that was lying in the road stripped and naked. Now here's the point that really got them going. When the Lord said in verse 33, but a certain Samaritan. Boy, you talk about history. That's going all the way back here to Ezra. These here that there was a divide already in history over all those years. They didn't consider these even to be Jews anymore. A certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. This is our Lord Jesus Christ identifying himself with these half-breeds, these Samaritans, just like he did with a Samaritan woman. Remember at the well in John 4? When the disciples came back, they marveled that he was even talking to her. Even she marveled. How is it that thou being a Jew speakest to me, a woman, a Samaritan? But here it is. When he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an end and took care of him. On the morrow, when he departed, he took two pence, gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, 
he that showed mercy on him then said Jesus unto them on him go and do thou likewise a lot there about Christ being that good Samaritan caring for his own but Christ did come in the world just to, for the Jews that was, he calls they call him the, the savior of the world remember the Samaritan woman when she ran in into the town and told everybody who she had encountered, and she said, come see the savior of the world. It, it, it doesn't mean he came to save everybody in the world, but he came to save Jew and Gentile. And so this is the groundwork back here in 2 Kings chapter. And you say, well, why, why would Zerubbabel here not want to accept their offer? Well, it's because back here in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 24, these are described, and they were already in the land when Nebuchadnezzar came down and took away the southern tribes. These, these were ones that were already in the land. 2 Kings chapter 17, it says, And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kuthal and from Ava and from Hamah, and from Shepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their <coughs> dwelling there, notice, that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the city of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them. Behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. And continue to read on. These are the ones that were still there when the Lord brought these back from Babylon. But the point that we see here is that what appeared to be for them in verse 2 a desire to cooperate why can't we get along to get along well you can't cooperate with those that don't know the Lord and uh, there's a message here even for those of us today where People accuse us and they criticize us for being isolationists. You know how it is when you get together with your family and begin to point them to the Christ of Scripture. What's their first react? Oh, so you think you're the only ones that are saved? That's their that's what comes out of their heart. They don't understand why it is that we can't join hand in hand with them in anything pertaining to the work of God. Well, the reason is we don't worship the same God. And you're gonna find that wherever you take that stand, just like what Paul wrote to the Corinthians, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will be a God unto you. We don't need the cooperation of religious people to do the work of God. When you think today about all these organizations that are multiplying and continue to multiply, it makes your head swim. And then you think about how it is that God has purposed that we worship God alone. People don't understand this congregation here. I've dealt with it in the 25, 26 years I've been here in Shreveport. Now, people, they want to know, well, who do you work with and who are you associated with? And when you tell them that we, we have no associations, we have no affiliations, we have no organization, they just can't fathom. They treat you like a leper, which we are to them. But we are as a bunch of lepers that God's been pleased to heal, deliver. That's okay with me. But 
that you've got all these organizations and even down to confessions of faith, people want to know well, what, what confession of faith do you follow? Are you Baptist, are you Protestant, are you Reformed, Sovereign Grace, New Covenant, all these terms that you hear people using today. No, we stand or fall with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is that foundation. And when Zerubbabel was laying this foundation of the temple, it's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other foundation that can be laid than that which is laid. That's Christ. He's the chief cornerstone. And by his spirit, he's calling out and placing on that foundation everyone for whom he paid the sin debt. So when people come to us and they want to join hands or get us involved in their projects, that's another aspect. I get letters all the time, go to the mailbox and come back and here's another advertisement wanting us to join with some of their projects and what they're doing. Why is it that we can't? Because, again, it comes down to the same thing. We don't worship the same God. They like to make believe they do. That's just like here in verse 2 of Ezra 4. Let us build with you. For we seek your God. Really? <laughs> let's talk about that. Before we can join hands in prayer, let's figure out what kind of God we're praying to. They say it's the same thing. But then they reveal their own apostasy when they say, we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Ezar had on king of Asher, which brought us up hither. They're already letting them know that the God that they worship is that of even this king of Asher, where The Lord took them into captivity because of their idolatry. And so, Scripture warns against forbidden alliances. If you look over to Exodus chapter 23, there's a couple of scriptures that I just quoted, but I'll have us look at them. This, the Lord warned the people of Israel early on right from coming out of Egypt through the Passover land in Exodus 23 and verses 32 and 33. Look what it says here. Thou shalt make no covenant with them nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, little G-O-D-S, it will surely be what? A snare unto thee. And you look at how many there are today in these organizations. The snare is that what they preach and teach is compromised. They can't preach and teach what we enjoy here week in and week out because they're under the headship of somebody else that's going to correct them and say, well, you can't say that. You can't do that. I'm thankful not to be guided or directed by any, any human, but only this word, when I sit in there and prepare and come out here, I don't have to worry about somebody up the hierarchy that's going to take offense at me giving Christ too much glory. But that's what happens whenever you get into these associations and organizations. You start trying to satisfy men, next thing you know, it's another gospel. Here's a scripture I quoted over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Paul writing to the Corinthians. And giving them this encouragement. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 
17. You know, go up to verse 14 when it says there, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. A lot of people like to relate that to marriage, but it's not. In this context, it has to do with worship. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It's in the context of worship. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? How can you join in a, what they call ecumenical worship service where there's not even agreement on who God is, who Christ is, how God saves, how he justifies sinners? What fellowship have righteousness Righteousness is that which Christ earned and established and God imputed. That's righteousness. With unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is anything other than that. Doesn't matter how good it looks, it's still unrighteousness. What communion have light with darkness? It tells us right there that unless you have the righteousness of God in Christ, you are in darkness. What concord, it gets even more specific here. What concord hath Christ with Belial? There's one doctrine that is of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, the other is of Satan. What part hath he that believeth with an infirm? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? You can't preach the salvations of the Lord and at the same time, hold hands with somebody says, yeah, but man still has his choice. That, that's our dog. Ye are the temple of the living God. When he says ye are the temple, it's not talking about this personal body here. He's talking about the church being the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What's the instruction? Wherefore, come out from among them. Be separate, said the Lord. That was the stand that Zerubbabel took. Come out and be separate. No, we don't even want one bit of your contribution to this temple, to this work. Come out and be separate. In what? Touch not the unclean thing. The unclean thing is all of their good works. It's as filthy rags before a holy God. He says, I'll receive you will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. That's where I find, over time, a lot of people come and go. They can't stand the isolation or the opposition. They can sit for a good while, but all of a sudden, they get a burr under their skin, thinking, you know, there's not a whole lot of us meeting here together. I think I'm going to go on down the road there. Find me a place where I can have more people so I can fellowship with them. Well, if they ever leave, they never were with us. That's what John said. They went out from us because they never were of us. They've never been taught of the Lord. Never been taught by His Spirit. And so coming back here to Ezra 4, Zerubbabel rightly refuses their offer. He's a type of Christ. Zerubbabel and Jeshua. The rest of the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel said to them, You may do nothing. That sounds like pretty strong language, doesn't it? But they were telling it like it is. You may do nothing with us to build a house for our God. There's a difference. There I see the unity. Because I mentioned just Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief. Of the fathers of Israel. That's that's what the Spirit of God does, brings unity and oneness of mind and heart to those who are his. So with one voice they refused the help of these Samaritans. They did this knowing that they had the permission, even the command of the King of Cyrus. And uh, that the Lord would take care of them. What it boils down to is worshiping a different God. The Samaritans didn't worship Jehovah God. In fact, that was the point. You go over to John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman until the Lord opened her eyes. And 
there, I love it, it says, when Christ said that he must needs go through Samaria. It was because of this woman. And when he asked her water to drink, she said that in verse 9. Then said the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. She, that goes all the way back here to Ezra. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. But as the Lord goes, continues to teach. There were some areas in which there was commonality because they were looking for a Messiah to come even as the Jews did. But you can see she makes a distinction there in John 4.20. Our fathers worshipped in this mount, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, it was to come through that Jewish line, speaking of himself. But the hour cometh, and now is, he says, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So as the Lord taught her, he was showing her that all that division, all that difference, worship in the air and worship in there and this place or that, didn't matter. Where Christ had come to pay the sin debt, therein is the oneness. And the Lord draws different ones. Some Samaritans, some Jews. But where God has done that work of grace, there is that oneness of mind. So we're going to stop there for now. I want to read the entire portion. As I said, from here forward, there's going to be, this is the way it's going to be. There's going to be conflict and resistance from those that opposed work of the Lord. Even as today, Christ said, in the world you shall have persecution. But he said, fear not, I have overcome the world.